Before we get into today's episode, I want to share with you a podcast that I think you would enjoy. When Sarah Davis lost her father in 2020, her grief was so raw and overwhelming. It was like standing in the face of an oncoming storm and trying to breathe wind. She created the podcast, Breathing Wind, as a way to process this grief with others who had also lost a parent. Before long, Sarah realized that Breathing Wind was becoming a community that created a space to talk about loss in a way that isn't done enough in our society. Each season of Breathing Wind follows Sarah's own grief process, with season one featuring stories from people who were the first of their peers to lose parents, followed by season two, where Sarah and three guest hosts explore different modes of healing. Currently in its third season, Breathing Wind is investigating the intersection of joy and grief, with guest hosts sharing the joy they find in so many different ways, from being in the wilderness, expressing and enjoying humor, recognizing their own resilience, and fully exploring the senses. This show has meant a lot to me over the past year. If you're experiencing grief over the loss of a loved one, especially a parent, and are looking for ways to work with it, Sarah Davis's podcast, Breathing Wind, is a great place to start. At the end of this show, I'll include a trailer to Breathing Wind. You can find Breathing Wind anywhere you listen to podcasts and at breathingwind.com. Do you want to change the world? So do I. On this show, we meet artists whose work is doing just that. Welcome to Art Heals All Wounds. I'm your host, Pam Uzel. Have you ever stopped to think about how important you are? Seriously, without any hyperbole, this is true. And I'm important too. What we do in this world, on this planet, affects others. You might be on the other side of the world from me, and your actions could impact me, for better or worse. Now for worse, that's a heavy thing to think about. What about for better, though? The potential in that is pretty amazing and powerful. These are some of the things I was thinking about after talking to my guest on today's episode. We are interconnected, and when we create something of beauty together, we strengthen those bonds between us with unforeseen and unknowable positive impact on the world. William Rhodes is a mixed media artist residing in San Francisco, California. He's also the program director of an intergenerational arts program through Bayview Senior Services in the Bayview-Hunters Point neighborhood. Drawn to art from an early age, William also enjoyed spending time in the company of his elders and learned a lot about the value of intergenerational relationships. On a trip to South Africa, he learned how a community quilt-making project could create bonds between children who were oceans apart, as well as introducing children to the positive benefits of working with their elders in the community. I'm so glad to have him on the show to talk about the unforeseen and wonderful outcomes of these communal art projects and how his work reflects how we are all tied together. Hi, William. Welcome to this episode of Art Heals All Wounds. Can you introduce yourself by telling us who you are and what you do? My name is William Rhodes. 
I'm a mixed media artist, and I also am a program director of an intergenerational arts program through Bayview Senior Services. And I first learned about you through your work on a zine for the anti-eviction mapping project. And I think it was called We Are Here. Yes. Can you describe that project for us? Yeah, it's a great project. I was invited to be a part of it by Alexandria Lacey. She saw some of the work that I did and I was brought in because of um, my focus of kind of really focusing on creating art around the displacement and gentrification of the African-American community. So with that project, I was actually invited to host a series of workshops. They were like quilt making workshops that we did with community people. And then some of my artwork, along with images of the workshops, were included actually in, in a final book. Well, for people who aren't from the San Francisco Bay Area, I know that you have a connection to Bayview Hunters Point, which is one of the areas where displacement is a real reality for the African American community. And can you just explain what is Bayview Hunters Point? Some of the, if you know it, the historical significance of the neighborhood. Yeah, it's a pretty powerful community. It has a long history going way back. We're really beyond the shipyard. So it was best known because that community had a housed a Navy shipyard where many African Americans were brought in from the South to come in and work at that shipyard. And then from there, a community really became stronger. But the African American story is, is much older than that shipyard, like I said, which was, we're talking World War II era. The community was, you know, at one point very self sufficient and in some ways isolated from the rest of San Francisco as far as transportation goes. And then we're talking the 1960s, there was quite a bit of civil unrest and things started to change and people in the community really started to fight for things like supermarkets in the community or proper health care because they felt like they were being isolated from the rest of San Francisco. So it has a long history of political activism, people that were really fighting for the community, and famous people, even the likes of James Baldwin, came to Bayview Hunters Point back in the 60s to really deal with the issues of kind of the injustices and, and really the inequalities of that neighborhood compared to many of the others in San Francisco. And th there is a documentary, I think, called Take This Hammer, which kind of focuses on that. Wow. Yeah, it has this long history. And to this day, it's still considered a African-American community, although the population is a lot less now. African-Americans may be number two or number three as far as the numbers go, as far as population. But there is still an African-American presence in that community. Right. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned healthcare because you just finished a public art project, didn't you, in a new healthcare center there, the Southeast Family Health Center? Yes. Can you talk about that project? Yes, it was such a great project for me. <laughs> I call it the food for my soul project. <laughs> what, <laughs> what I mean by that is I learned so much because I'm not from San Francisco. I'm originally from Baltimore, Maryland, but the community felt very similar to Baltimore in many ways. And I've been here since 2008, so I'm learning as we go. That project consisted of a series of, I call them history quilts, which focus on the activism that took place in the community. So, for example, one quilt is dedicated to social political activism. And there's all of these images, these hand painted images that I included of historic people that helped make that happen. There's environmental justice, people that really fought for the community dealing with those issues healthcare activism, and then the last is housing activism. Why this is food for the soul for me is because I got to sit down with elders from the community that actually live this 
and they sat and educated me on key people, the history, how things went down, you know, just all of this stuff. So I took that and, you know, various people, Mr. Oscar James is a historian in the community. He gave me photographs from his personal collection, Karen Pierce. It was a variety of people that helped me with this. And I got these photographs and these images and used them to help document the history of the Bayview. And I must say, there are many people that I left out and I'm sorry I had to do that, but it was such a rich history. I probably would have had to make 20 quilts or more just to fill that history. Wow. I'm really curious. Can you talk about why in a health center do you need to have this artwork that's also documenting history? Why, what's the intersection there? Why is that important? Well, one reason, which is such a great concept, is the fact that so many people from the community go into that health center. And I'm not just the only artist, so I have to say there's there's other beautiful works of art by other artists from the community. But just being there, you know, you're spending your time, you get to look at this art and it be, it's meaningful because it ties in with the community. Why the Southeast Health Center, I feel, because it was such a community push to bring that about. You know, it's a beautiful state of the art healthcare center. And before residents had to go further into the city, some people didn't have cars. So to have it in their neighborhood was just amazing. And it's right next to an old, the older um, health center, which was much smaller and really focused on dental care and other things. So this is right next to it. And now, like I said before, people that live in a community that don't have the resources to travel, they can just walk to this beautiful center mm -hmm. and they get to see, you know, art that tells stories of their history. And many people actually can spot people on the quilts. For example, my work that are family members. Wow. They can know that their aunts or cousins or whatever who are a part of history are documented on these quilts. Right. Why is that kind of representation or reflection of the history of a place and of a certain community? Why is that something that people need? Well, we live in a world where, you know, we have so much access to, you know, media, television, and everything else. So there's so much access. And I think that it's great in some sense, but also it can create a situation where people can feel like they're not always being represented in a larger context. I mean, of course, YouTube, smaller channels, people, you know, you see everybody on it, but there are other ways people don't feel represented. So to see people that are a part of your family or people that you personally know or people that look like you that have really done great things that inspires you to do better. And also in particular young people, you know, when young people come into the space or actually see this representation of family members or people that look like them, that gives them incredible inspiration and lets them know that they can push and do great things themselves. It's not impossible. And it's also mm -hmm. not something that's so far removed, like in a history book that goes back 200 years. They, they're a part of this current history. Right. So if you can see it, it helps you to imagine it for yourself. Yes. Wow. Well, I'm really curious, for you as an artist, why did you choose quilts? We've seen some beautiful artwork in quilts. And why did you choose to do quilts? I have to be honest, I think quilts chose me <laughs> because <laughs> I could, if you would have told me 20 years ago that I would be making quilts, I would have laughed at you. <laughs> you know, I don't want to get into a whole long story, but you can. <laughs> okay. Well, quilting has always been around me, whether it be like family members or having them around. And I didn't see any value, like zero value in them. And then I was around some amazing quilters in my community. There's a, a famous bead artist named Joyce J. Scott, and her mother was a quilter, Elizabeth Talbert Scott. And so she would make these quilts, and I just thought they were cool, but I didn't really feel a, a strong connection to it. 
But over time, and I took a trip with Joyce Scott and a group of other artists. I joined them on a project in South Africa. And that project led me to really discover the medium of quilting and realizing how quilting can bring a community together. In South Africa, the project basically consisted of myself and with the help of other artists, we went into these uh, communities, these townships in South Africa, had kids produce these little sections, squares of a quilt. And then I went back to San Francisco and had students in San Francisco add squares to the quilt and we put it all together and we produced five quilts. And then I saw just the excitement because the kids in San Francisco had so many questions and just interest in the kids in South Africa. And they noticed certain things, you know, like in some of the townships, the kids did not have shoes for themselves. They had to share shoes. If you were in a classroom or in a setting that you had to run outside, there were just, I would say, just some shoes that you could use to run around outside and bring them back. Some of the neighborhoods didn't even have walls, like what you would consider it would be a field and just chairs. That was the school. So mm -hmm. students in San Francisco just wanted to help. And we're talking elementary school kids at Dr. Charles Drew Elementary School. They came up with the concept of wanting to do a clothing drive and send stuff to the kids in South Africa, which we did. And so this quilt project grew into producing quilts, creating this connection. They were able to talk to the students and also the students could send things to the other students in South Africa. So I knew at that point, it's like, man, I had this medium is definitely a part of me now, this quilt making medium. Wow. Well, you know, it's so interesting because there's always been this long division between arts and crafts. Yes. And I think a lot of the crafts were things that maybe, I don't know if you agree, but might be things that might be considered work for women mm -hmm. as opposed to art. And it's really wonderful to sort of hear this division between those two things, arts and crafts, to start to break down a little bit. Yes. Because you're right. A lot of the same things, you know, what is the difference between someone getting paints and painting a painting and someone gathering fabric and all these things and creating this quilt? But what I really love that you're talking about is this community aspect of quilt making. Yes. Yeah. And, and it humbles me. It humbles me because I don't really consider myself like a, a serious quilter. There are people that just are amazing. And what I mean when I said I'm humble because if I do a workshop, there are many seniors that will come in and teach me stuff, you know, so mm -hmm. I'm learning as we go. And, and it is community because, yeah, I may be ho hosting the workshop, but, you know, they could come in and teach me just as much and show other people something and, and we're learning. And then that, that adds to it. So it continues, continues to live. Right. And I just in researching some of your work, there are two things. I saw another quilt making project that you did, and it was also very intergenerational. It was the for the We Are Bruce Lee yes. exhibit. <laughs> that was a blast. Yes. Well, first, can you talk about that quilt making project? Because it seemed like it also involved a lot of work with school children. It did. And seniors. I was, I was, again, very fortunate to be invited. There are two dynamic uh, curators, Melanie Malore Green from the Triple mm -hmm. African American Art and Culture Complex. They invited me to work with Shannon Lee. Shannon Lee is Bruce Lee's daughter, the legendary martial artist Bruce Lee. That is his daughter. And she was putting together, along with another curator, a show about her father's life and legacy. And the interesting thing about Bruce Lee, which I didn't know before, Bruce Lee had a philosophy, which was about bringing community together. And he really was focused on breaking a traditional stereotype of who should know and learn martial arts. So mm. he went into communities that were non-Chinese uh, communities. For example, his first student was a black student. So that broke a lot of barriers and he had 
black students, white students, Latino students. That changed really a lot of things with the views of martial art. So this show wanted to really reflect this bringing together of all of these different groups to, to, you know, for the love of martial arts or this community. So I worked, yes, with Shannon Lee. And basically what I did is I was able to get a group of Asian American youth and Asian American seniors, along with African American youth and African American seniors. We all came together and this is through Bayview Senior Services. We had a day, we were in the park, we had several days, but one of our big events, we were in MLK Park and we all came together. We had some food, we had music, and I gave people quilt squares and just stepped back and let them do their thing. And there were language barriers. You know, some people didn't speak the same language, but you know, mm -hmm. all of that tension, just division, everything. Literally, that event, you watched it fade away. You saw people sitting next to people that wouldn't ordinarily, people that didn't speak English trying to communicate or communicating with people that did speak English. It was just, it was amazing. I literally just stood back to watch just the dynamics. And they produced wow. all of these amazing squares, which got added to the center panels of three quilts dedicated to Bruce Lee. Wow. You know, that just gave me chills when you're talking about how working together on this art project could dissolve the divisions between communities. Yeah. It really makes you think about what potential that sort of activity has. Yes. Yeah. And why do you focus so much on intergenerational collaborations? Why is that meaningful to do that? Well, I, you know, grew up in a really interesting environment, and I think it goes back to that. I'm an only child. I was really the youngest of all of my cousins, and I was surrounded around a lot of adults my entire life. Mm. I'm a person who experienced quite a bit of bullying and kind of being in an environment where it was a lot of uh, physical struggle. <laughs> That's a good word, mm. way to put it. You know, I got into a lot of fights and I was a small kid. So I think I found myself, number one, to avoid constant conflict, getting into producing art, you know, myself. That was one thing. But I was also enjoyed the company of seniors or old, not seniors, older people. And as I grew older, I really, you know, knew the value and importance I'm also blessed with having a grandfather that lived to be 103, a grandmother wow. that lived to be 100, great grandparents that lived to be in their 90s. Wow. So I had this around me and I knew how it really was, it created such a stable foundation for me. So fast forward to me, you know, the time that I started teaching, I started off really teaching art and after school programs in, in the Bayview with the Bayview Opera House. And I would go into some of these schools and I could just really see how some of these the young st students really did not have this co same connection with older people the same way I had. Mm. Some of them felt very uncomfortable around older people. Some of them just really didn't trust or understand or know just how to respect or have the dynamics of it. So I just felt like there was a need to really bring that together. And I understood that, you know, some of the students were in homes that didn't necessarily have a grandparent or an older adult or someone there to kind of guide them or create a foundation. So I felt like in many ways I wanted to do something that could work, you know, to really fix that mm. or improve that area. So the intergenerational programs really started to bring together both groups, the young and the old. And I saw this symbiotic relationship that they had. It's not one-sided. It really isn't because the youth do a lot for the seniors. The seniors do a lot for the youth. And honestly, I will set up the projects, host the projects, be involved in it, but at a certain point, I try to step back and just let things naturally happen. The other thing is, it was interesting. 
I'm coming into the schools and there would sometimes be discipline issues. You know, some of the kids were really, they'd walk in the door really upset or Mm -hmm. just kind of agitated from whatever. And as the teacher trying to work with them and everything else, and it wouldn't always work. But when I put them, I noticed sometimes with older people, like their grandparents age or something like that, those same kids that gave me hell would respond so quickly to these seniors. Those seniors knew how to control the situation and handle it. It was amazing. And I literally was just blown away in particular, just seeing that happen. So again, it's just amazing to see this type of collaboration come together and just see it naturally work out. Mm, That's so interesting. So I've seen these other work of yours that from a distance might look like a painting or something, but it's actually mixed media and it combines things like paper, photographs, wood, other found objects, and they all have red thread. What is the significance behind this red thread in these works? That's a great question. So to answer the first part of your question, so the red thread for me is definitely a blood connection. Mm. And also I feel like the thread in itself to me is a symbol for our actions, the things we do, the events that take place around us, the events that we cause, it affects everything. So basically, you know, the thread for me is really how it ties everything together. So it's like a garment, for example, and I don't want to give too many examples, but, you know, if you have a garment like a sweater, you're just looking at that sweater. You're not looking at the threads necessarily, but it takes, mm-hmm. you know, thousands of threads or, or sections of threads that produce this sweater, this garment. And if you start pulling on it, you know, it all unravels into these, this long thread, but it's all connected. And that's how I feel, you know, really life is and the things that we do. So really, I started off, I did these portraits of people from my family starting off and also people from the community. I would do drawings and then uh, just pencil and on paper drawings or pencil and ink. And then I would go in and start to sew this red thread into it. Wow. Now, where that came from, why I wanted to start sewing into paper, I don't really know the answer to that, but I could tell you how it made me feel. It made me feel like very relaxed. The process of the sewing into the paper felt like meditative because I would watch television while I'm sewing into this paper. And then it was a reminder of this sewing stitch that my grandmother taught me. She taught me this one stitch. So I was able to incorporate that. So it was like a, like a meditative process creating this. And then I would look at the piece and realize, man, you, you did a sewing, you covered like most of the piece with, <laughs> with this red thread, you know, but it was, yeah. it just naturally happened. So that's where the thread, the red thread comes from, this connection. Now, I've been doing these for a long time. And when I started and used to talk to people about it, you know, people that were close to me, they kind of got it, but they didn't really get it when I talked about, you know, how our actions affect other people and how, you know, we are all connected and, and, and the things that we do, we could be a million miles away, but it still affects something else. People didn't really necessarily around me get that until you know, I'd say in the past 10 years, and now Hmm. it's like we see it everywhere, whether it be the environmental impacts of one area impacts another, whether it be politically, whether it be controlling people's, you know, rights or whatever you think of, it is impacting one group is impacting another group. And our actions absolutely impact the whole. So now it doesn't mm. seem as strange. And it, and I feel like now it's kind of in line with the where we are right now in our society. Right. That's fascinating. Yeah. Well, they're, they're really interesting. Are they on exhibit anywhere where I could actually see them up close? Yeah. So I should also say this. So I have a series of these drawings that I sew into with red thread. 
but I also do the process with sculptures too. So I have sculptures that are, you know, usually carved wood. They have elements in them, different elements. I like to incorporate neon, neon signs, like the letters that are, you plug up yeah. and they're neon. And then it still has the drawings with the sewn needle and thread in it. So to answer your question, so they're going to be in an exhibition called Black Artists on Art, which is going to be at the Crocker Museum in Sacramento, California. That's going to be opening up soon. And that'll be up until I think the end of October. So that's one show. And then the other exhibition is a show in New Jersey, which we're, I'm still getting all the details with that, but that's out of town. And I'd be happy to let you know once I get all of the final details with that. Yeah, yes, please do. Well, William, if people just want to know more about you and your work in general, where should they look? They can go to my website, which is www williamrhodesart.com. You can definitely check out my Facebook page. I try to respond as quickly as I can, but I will respond. That's William Rhodes Art on Facebook. Okay. Well, I really appreciate you being on the show and telling me about some of your ideas and your experience behind doing both the public art and the intergenerational projects. That's both fascinating. And I think it really ties into your idea of using the red thread, this connectivity between all of us and how our actions affect other people, other places. We are all connected. Yes, absolutely. You're listening to Art Heals All Wounds. I'm so glad that William shared the stories behind his work with us. I hope you'll look for William's work at williamrhodesart.com. And if you're in California, try to check out William's work in the exhibition Black Artist on Art at the Crocker Museum in Sacramento through the end of October 2022. I'd love to explore more art projects that build bridges between communities, particularly some that serve as a way to address and begin to heal past conflicts. If you know of any projects like that, please share them with me. You can always reach me through my website, artheelsallwoundspodcast.com or on Twitter or Instagram at Art Heals Podcast. If you're enjoying this show, please give it a follow on your favorite podcast listening app. The music you've heard in this podcast is by Ketza and Lobo Loco. This podcast was edited by Eva Hristova. Art Heals All Wounds comes to you from Oakland, California, on unceded territory of the Chokenyo Ohlone people. I'm Sarah Davis, founder and producer of Breathing Wind, a podcast about grief, parent loss, change, and healing. This season, I'm joined by four amazingly talented guest hosts. We are discussing joy in its many forms from different angles with the recognition that joy is a complex emotion. So what is joy? Joy takes into account the full spectrum of feelings. Joy is the both and. In other words, joy can be felt at any time for any reason with other emotions like grief. Joy is who we are when our hearts are at their wildest. It's the integration between our doing and our being. And it's when I feel most alive and fulfilled. And I get to experience that when I'm in the wilderness. And I get to witness that when I see others in the wilderness. I find joy through a deep sense of connection, through an experience with someone or something 
generated by love, gratitude, awe, and oftentimes for me, humor. Joy is my inherent nature. I really do feel it to be the essence of who I am and how I move through the world, which is interesting because so much of the work I do is around grief and loss and dying. And yet those experiences and journeys are so much more expansive than we might believe them to be and are capable of holding joy too and many other positive emotions that we might not associate with them. You can listen to us at breathingwind.com or wherever you get your podcasts.